Hey there, welcome back to Alpha Bunga Bunga. On this episode, we're talking about anger, mistrust, and fear. We'll be joined by William Davis to discuss this, which is just as well as he's the author of Nervous States, How Feelings Took Over the World, which came out recently and covers a lot of ground from the encroachment of war into peace, such that we feel we're always at war, to the politicization of science. We'll also take the opportunity to discuss why neoliberalism might be best understood as a logic of competition, the end of ideology, and whether we need to slow down so as to speed up. Here it is. All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to Alpha Bunga Bunga. As you just heard in the introduction, we have William Davis with us to discuss his new book, Nervous States, as well as his previous work. Uh, joining me, Alex Hochelis, Alpha Bunga Bunga co-producer and co-host, George Hoare. The other two guys uh, aren't here this week. And I think mainly it's going to be George leading the question. So I'm going to hand over to him immediately. Thanks. Um, yeah, really great to have you on, Will. Um, so, yeah, I guess just to to kind of kick it off the the first first question, really. So the late, your latest book, Never States, How Feeling Took Over the World, explores how expertise and emotion function in contemporary politics and i'm sure we'll dig into some examples of this um but first off what what is a nervous state um and why do you think this term is important in politics and society today yeah um well first of all thanks for having me on today um the book the title of the book is a pun i suppose in that it refers both to a state of nervousness that um, our politics has entered, that governments have entered. I suppose a sense that we are um, on the brink of something. And that's, I think, a, a, a feeling that many people um, share. I mean, that's not to try and be alarmist, but I think that there is a um, part of what the book is about is the sense that the division between um, war and peace is no longer quite as clear as uh, liberalism has historically sought to assert. Um, we're no longer quite so clear about what counts as violence in various ways. And one of the themes in the book is the uh, growing vagueness surrounding what counts as, as war, both in the sense of that um, increasingly we understand our political uh, arguments and disagreements in terms of wars of one kind or another. We talk of culture war and this sort of thing. But at the same time, what counts as actual warfare um, has become increasingly slippery and immaterial in the way in which people talk about uh, cyber war and information war and these kind of forms of weaponization that are, are going on, which are uh, allegedly disrupting uh, democracies and so on. So there's a kind of sense of jumpiness that is partly what the title of Nervous States alludes to there. But it's also about the changing way in which knowledge works, you know, in, in, in a philosophical sense, um, that, I mean, the classic modern ideal of, of knowledge and of expertise is that the mind, as something separate from the body, um, produces these representations of the world, these, 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 these pictures or models of the world. And this is something that I trace right back to the 17th century. But if we think of what it means to operate in a nervous sense and ultimately the the brain, which is now a, a more, I suppose, powerful uh, means of understanding ourselves than, than, than minds uh, much of the time. But the nerves are things that operate in a real time fashion, that they, mm -hmm. they alert us to the here and the now. And I think that both in the ways in which we have become um, that, you know, the, the, the body is reshaping the, the status of emotion in, in politics at the moment. That's a theme in the book, but also the fact that the technologies that we surround ourselves with and the technologies which enable us to encounter the world. And I'm talking principally about digital technologies are in many ways making us more nervous, you know, in, in, in quite a sort of literal sense in that they are tools for the sensing of the here and the now, for making us more and more alert to change as it happens around us right now. I mean, this is how the media is changing the whole t sort of rapidly, uh, but less and less able to produce more stable um, representations of the world of the sort that we refer to as facts. So it's about that kind of shift, really, from a society of which creates static images of the world in a classically modern sense to one which has a heightened sensibility to uh, real time change. Mm. So I have to say that, yeah, I, I got the the pun of the title of the book, um, <laughs> but 
but quite belatedly <laughs> probably <laughs> later than than I should have done but yeah so just just to kind of um I guess dig down a little bit on this state of nervousness and and hyper alertness and all, all these sorts of things which you which you capture in the book um for listeners who haven't read the book could you maybe just expand a bit on you know what does it feel like as an individual to to live in this in this sort of um society with this sort of information and ways of accessing the world yeah um, I mean one of the so I start the book with a, a particular example, um, which is something that many Londoners will um, remember. It's just about um, a year ago, actually, um, which was a, a panic that happened in uh, Oxford Circus, uh, where for one reason or another, um, people began to think there was some kind of terror attack underway, and this led to a sort of sort of triggered a um, big um, sort of ripple effect through crowds of people feeling that something was underway and this sort of escalated and escalated. But it crucially, it was also, it turned out to, to, to be based on absolutely nothing at all. It was purely a sort of movement mm. of, of sensations and of, and, of, and of fears and of anxieties through a crowd. Um, and what I suppose was different from if that had, I mean, that could have happened at any point in, in, in recent decades, I suppose. But what was one thing that was different was that the media was able to report this as it was happening. And not only that, but social media was able to report this as it was happening. And members of the crowd were able to share videos. There was a pop star, Ollie Murs, who was in the middle of it, who tweeted to eight million people as it was underway that there were gunshots and everyone had to, you know, was being evacuated and so on. So mm. the, the point of this story in, in the book and is to try and open up in answer to your question about what, what does it mean to be an, an individual in, in this type of society, that to be um, uh, to live in a, in, a, in in this age of of, re- of the real time data and real time media means that increasingly we do have to trust our instincts to a great extent. We uh, while we become better and better at we we have more and more powers of navigation in a real time sense. You think of sort of you know the powers of things like Google Maps and and sat navs and that sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. Our ability to actually sort of stand outside of the flow and actually to take stock and to carry out some form of critical judgment of our situation uh, arguably becomes harder under these kind of conditions. So I think that this has uh, this changes the, the 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 status of the self in society in, in in certain respects. I mean, clearly modern cities have been creating a sort of overwhelming um, sensibilities. I mean, there's some of the earliest sociologists such as Georg Zimmel wrote about this in the late 19th mm. century of how, of how the city was sort of generated as a sort of overwhelming sensory experience. But I think that now increasingly people uh, are sort of developing a sort of, I think, a, a, a kind of jumpiness that um, being in touch with um, flows of data, with possible change, with... Um, uh, what might be going on in the markets and so on is something that doesn't leave people alone as much. And one of the sources of this, I mean, there are various things that, that, have, that have generated this, this state of affairs. I mean, one is clearly the changing status of the media over the last um, kind of 15 years or so. But I also link it to neoliberalism in, in certain ways, because I think if you go back through the history of neoliberal ideas, as I do in the book, um, in, in one chapter, I, I look particularly at the ideas of Friedrich Hayek, who was the, I suppose, probably the most famous neoliberal thinker of them all, for whom mm. the, the 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 value of knowledge isn't its ability to create um, a, a consensus about reality, which is what it was for the scientific pioneers of the 17th century. For for those scientific pioneers, what knowledge does is it it produces a what scientific knowledge does rather is it produces a a picture of the world or a story about the world that everybody can agree on. And once everyone mm. can agree on it, then they can add to it and they can, you know, they can disagree about all sorts of other things, but they can agree on facts. And this is a sort of an astonishing um, achievement of, of, of modernity, really. Now for Hayek, knowledge does, is the, the value of knowledge is quite different. For Hayek, knowledge which is really useful is the knowledge that I've got and you haven't got. And I, if I can act on that knowledge before you've got it, then I can achieve some kind of competitive advantage over you. And so in a way, what happens under neoliberalism is that knowledge becomes a source of competitive advantage. It becomes a private good rather than a, a, a public basis of, of consensus or shared reality. And if you take this to its sort of ultimate conclusion, as I point out in the book, you would get to something like high frequency trading, where you know, people invest large amounts of money in moving their server one meter closer to the Atlantic Ocean so that they can, can they can um, sense the price signals as they're coming across from New York mm. or vice versa, kind of a fraction of a second before their rivals. So that 
need to be first and that need to gain some kind of one-upmanship over others becomes uh, the basis of the, the neoliberal engagement with the world. So I think that's part of the, the nervous state that I'm describing as well. So knowledge knowledge becomes indi individualised, super rapid. But Alex, I think you had, a, moving on from sort of metropolis and mental life, I think you had a, a question about another classic uh, uh, idea of social theory. Well, I mean... I guess if knowledge becomes competitive, there there's winners and losers, and there's some people who are out of control. I mean, who or don't uh, dominate affairs, who are you know, and who might want to take back control. I mean, the, the traditional way that this was discussed was under the term alienation, and it's interesting that I think you hardly use the term in the book. I mean, I had a search earlier, and I think you perhaps use it only in terms of political alienation. Um, mm. But not in the more um, in in the deeper and wider sense of of kind of a social or philosophical alienation. Um, so I guess one thing I wanted to ask was why not use that term, and that's just a matter of curiosity. I've no <laughs> that's not really a criticism at all. Um, but also the idea that to probe this further because alienation has such a long history, are we more alienated now? And are we more alienated now, as in the past ten years, than we were fifteen years ago? Well, I mean, I suppose we can discuss what alienation means. I mean, I, I hear it in a in a Marxist sense, and I, the book is is clearly not written in a in a Marxist theoretical framework. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, I mean, for Marx, alienation is is starts with being alienated from from one's own labour, and 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 kind of goes from there. I suppose there's a kind of existentialist sense of alienation, which is a kind of sense of 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 isolation or, or or even of ennui in, in a kind of Durkheimian sense or something. But I think that um, it didn't really occur to me to use that term. I mean, the book, in that sense, I suppose it's, it's, um, it's, it's not so, I suppose, as politically radical as, as, as it would be if it were to be based in that, in that, in that uh, language. I mean, what, what I'm, I suppose, interested in, in the book is how that, uh, th there was a the, the the achievement of the of the early enlightenment late 17th century was to create these institutions which enabled people to um share a common world um via the medium of facts expertise accounts um administration and so on now that is a very mixed achievement because it is also it was the basis of colonialism it was a clearly a, a patriarchal um a system that only included men uh, and white european men at that so it was not uh, a, a democratic achievement or necessarily a particularly emancipatory one but what we're witnessing at the moment is and i wouldn't call this alienation really but i i think is the is 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 the possibility of that being dismantled in certain ways i mean you hear of you know steve bannon talked about you know, seeking the, the deconstruction of the administrative state. And you hear this in the UK by certain Brexiteers, but also the the ability to turn on a scientist or a journalist and or a, um, a, a, a public servant of some kind and to say that they are, um, you know, that they are pursuing their own private political agenda of some kind. So that's turned to sort of basically the base of conspiracy theory. I think that what we're seeing at the moment, and I think the critical theory inevitably is kind of ambivalent on this because on the one hand critical theory has always sought to uh, sort of well criticize that liberal edifice and to say that the sheer facts of the administrative state or of liberal expertise or positivism and so on are um you know a sort of either a bourgeois construct or some form of governmentality in the language of Foucault or something like that and I don't disagree with that um but I think that um on the other hand where what kind of alienation or disillusionment can we actually cope with? Because what I think we're moving towards is a society which is simultaneously a one based around political authoritarianism, simul combined with big data and epistemology mm -hmm. of big data, where people encouraged by the likes of Julian Assange and these sorts of people effectively believe that the truth is um, sort of buried away somewhere and almost beyond human cognition, um, possibly within algorithmic cognition, but that is something that is in private hands, in the hands of people like Google and Facebook and so on. So the truth is kind of buried away in some sort of massive data bank in a way that was not the case for the for the liberal administrative state as it was born in the 17th century. Um, and instead, what people do is rather than sort of kind of treat 
the news as it's reported to them by CNN or the BBC or the facts produced by experts and, so and treat them pretty much credulously, people turn to uh, the pe certain kind of figures, whether they be demagogues or um, kind of whistleblowers or general um, sort of heroic truth tellers of some kind, and sort of follow that figure as a way of trying to sort of navigate a world that is ultimately completely beyond comprehension. So I think that the follow, the need to follow leaders becomes all the more important for people in a world where data is both too abundant and also too secret much of the time to be ever really cognized in, a, in any human sense. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned the sort of confluence between authoritarianism and big data because I did want to come on to a sort of parallel confluence that you might see today between, new, between technocracy and populism, which mm -hmm. are seemingly opposed. But I think we'll get on to that, I guess, in the third part of this. Um, what I did want to probe at, I guess, is this idea that, I mean, th that this, the, level, the degree of mistrust of knowledge is something that was mm. a feature of, I guess, what is called postmodernism, postmodernity, mm. poststructuralism, all that deep skepticism of objective knowledge. I th that seems to have um, coexisted over the past 40 years with an increasing defense of knowledge in the most narrow sense possible so mm -hmm. the clinging to facts and stats yeah. um something which is almost abstracted from any broader social truth um, sure. abstracted from meaning right that you just have these numbers on a mm. page which somehow have more meaning supposedly are presented as having more meaning than sure. uh, people's lived experience which is problematic yeah. and it's something that you you probe at um yeah. how do you see the relationship between those two because they seem to be opposed and yet they they coexist no, I think you're right. I mean, I think in a way what, what happened. So, I mean, if we date the, the kind of, I suppose, the postmodern turn was something that happened broadly between sort of, um, you know, after 1968, really, um, and developed alongside the turn towards neoliberalism and the, the turn away from Keynesianism. And I think that um, ultimately there are, there are various ways in which th these things do come together. I mean, one is that neoliberalism d does depend on a particular very narrow vision of technocracy rather than a, a, a kind of the Keynesian technocracy, which was very much geared towards trying to sort of govern in a, in a quasi-democratic fashion in the sense that it involves um, kind of, you know, Keynesianism depended on a certain kind of social and democratic legitimacy for its forms of knowledge to, to work. Uh, neoliberalism, as you say, I mean, ultimately is about sort of producing the, the conditions for competitiveness and the market and so on and it turns knowledge into something that is really something that that the technocrats in central banks being the, the probably the best example kind of deal with behind closed doors and it, be, it becomes a tool of power it becomes purely a tool of 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 governance as 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 the neoliberals like to say and in that sense neoliberal the, the way neoliberalism turn, sort of uses knowledge and uses it as a tool of power uh, really confirms the, the Foucauldian critique in, in mm -hmm. certain respects. And I think that the kind of the, the lack of concern, not just lack of concern, but the kind of antipathy to democracy, which is at the heart of neoliberalism, is totally clear in the in the writing of uh, people like Hayek and von Mises and, and Friedman and others, is that, you know, the governance of the market must be taken, must be separated from democracy in certain ways. This means that the technocrats have no real obligation to seek any type of public accountability or legitimacy. In fact, it's kind of better if they don't. So for a long time, you're absolutely right, that as, as the, the postmodern critique was, was developing, um, and a lot of it was, was merely a sociological description in the work of people like Lyotard and, and Foucault and others. Yeah. Um, but as that description was, was developing, it was being, I think, in many ways confirmed by, um, by what was going on inside the, the corridors of, of power. And I think that I mean, I think Richard Rorty says somewhere that, that truth is whatever your colleagues will let you get away with. And mm. ultimately, um, the, the, you know, if you worked in a, in a central bank or you worked in the European Commission or in the IMF or the OECD or something, you were talking to an extremely small cadre of, of, of other experts living in your world. And it really didn't occur to a lot of these people until kind of around about 2016 that the kinds of facts and statistics and data that they were assembling – didn't have any kind of purchase on on lived reality for large numbers of people. And one of the ways in which I explore that in the book is the sheer force of inequality that undermines the status of of things like GDP and and mm -hmm. and, the, and and macroeconomic indicators. Where in the United States, fifty this is the work that 
Thomas Piketty has published in the last couple of years showing that 50% of Americans have had no real increase in their, no increase in their real incomes since the late 1970s. So economic growth has just not been true for half of the population. Um, I mean, equally, you have I talk a bit about unemployment indicators, where unemployment rests on this kind of quite sort of simple Keynesian binary between either you've got a job or you haven't and you're looking for one. Uh, and actually, that doesn't really describe the way in which labour markets have changed over the last 40 years in terms of the rise of non-employment and the rise of mm -hmm. um, people who are dropping out due to exhaustion and drug addiction or people who are, have got a job but they're not earning enough or they're not getting enough hours and this sort of thing. So a lot of this kind yeah. of you know, the technocratic image of the world wasn't really tested in the political realm very much. Yeah. And so I think you, you draw this out in the book really well, how these it means that this uh, shared kind of idea of reality that previously used to define truth it doesn't you know it being reflected back to people it doesn't yeah. really uh does, doesn't resonate but no. just um to, to to kind of uh touch on another one of the key themes which um you talk about a lot in in the book and this is the idea basically of of war and how this has mm -hmm. been so important to driving a lot of these developments i mean is it too much of a simplification to say that the major thing driving the movement to nervous states has been the rise of of um i guess essentially non-state actors or non-state risks so the state now can't really say it will protect you and this hobbesian yeah. contract doesn't doesn't work anymore because it can't protect us so why should we why should we sign the social contract because yeah. uh, you know the state the state can't protect us from things which uh, which scare us sure well i think i mean one thing to i suppose it's always worth mentioning um without wanting to kind of jump into the Steven Pinker bandwagon uh, is that I mean the state I mean society yeah yeah <laughs> but I mean societies western societies have you know it's not in, in, a, in an objective statistical sense they haven't got suddenly a lot more violent um but I think that what what has happened is that um the well firstly that society has been um, flooded by technologies that were developed initially in a context of war, and, and that includes the internet. I mean, you know, these are the c computers and, and, and network computing are, 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 are technologies forged in a spirit of paranoia about the need to stay in touch with change, the need to detect trends and movements and behaviors as they bubble up, the need to be able to share intelligence very rapidly and to encrypt intelligence so that others can't, can't um, tap into it and so on. So, so that mentality of how to engage with the world and how to, to share and to accumulate knowledge about the world is one that arose in a context of, of war, but has become our sort of everyday way of engaging with the world. So in that sense, a, a, a war-like mm. spirit has taken off. I think that that's, that's one aspect of it. I think there is, um, I mean, inequality clearly is, 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 a, is a part of this as well. Um, but I think that I talk in the book about how the neoliberal cult of the entrepreneur, um, to, to really understand these kind of figures, it makes more sense to see them as as quasi-Napoleonic figures built around a, a, a kind of cult of leadership uh, and a cult of world making, I suppose, because one of the, the sort of main, I, the book is organized around two historical origin stories, really. One is the formation of, of, of liberal government following the religious wars of the 17th century. The second is the development of a, of a sort of ideal of, of real-time, uh, impulsive, quick-fire leadership and coordination as it emerged out of the French Revolution and in the Napoleonic Wars, um, and as celebrated in the work of Karl von Clausewitz, the uh, Prussian um, uh, general and a uh, Prussian uh, um, soldier and and scholar of war, um, but I mean, you know, th th in a way, entrepreneurship, the the ideology of entrepreneurship is all about the uh, capacity of certain individuals who have got what it takes, which is something that sort of they, lies deep within them to rearrange the world around their their will. I mean, this is you read the work of someone like Joseph Schumpeter. This is very clear, and he constantly uses metaphors from war about the, the the need to fight, the need to impose oneself, the need to to triumph almost for, for its own sake. Um, and I think that the, the the genealogy of much of the way in which we we think about our politics and we think about our personal lives uh, in some ways uh, owes as much to uh, that 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 sort of second origin story of, of 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 what came out of the French Revolution as it does to ideals of 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 liberal peace and and consensus. Yeah, I mean that was the bit which most 
kind of surprised me in a positive sense about the book is the role uh, that war takes in in the sort of the, the thinking that you present here. Uh, and it did remind me really that a point which I think has been made before, but which that that the Hobbesian depiction of society of a war of all against all might be more accurate, certainly in our age, than the Lockean one of uh, of um, of contractualism. Um, and I guess w- the the impetus behind this sort of war against, of all against all is the logic of competition. And I think that might be a nice segue to talk about your bu- your previous book, The Limit of Neoliberalism, um, yeah. and the way that you trace. Th- that I, the, rather to put it differently, the way that you perhaps distinguish uh, your interpretation of neoliberalism as a logic versus someone like David Harvey, who might probably be the most cited thinker on on neoliberalism or whose ideas on neoliberalism um, have a certain weight, would disagree with them uh, or agree with them, uh, because he he treats neoliberalism as class war from above, uh, and you take a slightly different position. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit on on what that is. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't entirely disagree with with David. What David Harvey writes, it's a different sort of methodological approach as much as anything else. But what I um, was interested in when when I started writing the book was the way in which um, the rhetoric and the governmental um, techniques um, of contemporary politics seemed to be based around an ideal of competition and competitiveness that wasn't simply about trying to spread markets um, or trying to increase the power of capital or of of corporations, although I think that's a sort of certainly part of it. But the competition as an ideal seemed to provide the template for um, uh, for, for, for neoliberal ideals of of political authority. And there is a sort of, in a way, um, by trying to rearrange not just markets around ideals of competition competitiveness but education um, uh, urban governance uh, social policy the arts higher education um, public service reform and so on that that actually the injection of competition and an ethos of competitiveness into all of these different areas is seen as having certain certain types of normative and utilitarian benefits to society of one kind or another so in the book what i what i look at is Specifically how neoliberal thinkers, and I look at at two different traditions, one being Chicago School of of Law and Economics and the other being something that is less commonly seen as neoliberal, but which is the uh, business strategy experts that were operating in Harvard Business School like Michael Porter and others. Um, But how they try to reimagine the state as much as anything else, rather than how do they try and sort of defend the market or or capital, how do they try and reimagine the state Around particular um, uh, notions of 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 the, the of, of competition, so that how do we think regulation? How do we think law? How do we think um, uh, uh, public policy in ways that is all about trying to in, impose competition as the central organizing plan for for social and economic life? And one thing that I'm very I make I sort of stress a lot in the book is that. And I think most scholars of neoliberalism would accept this, including people like Wendy Brown and, and Michel Foucault and Philip Moravsky and others, um, that what's crucial to the neoliberal mindset is that competition won't just happen inevitably or naturally in the way that someone like Adam Smith and the, the liberal political economists thought it would. Uh, competition is something that socialists and planners and Keynesians are, are constantly threatening to do away with or to suppress. And therefore, there needs to be a kind of constant vigilance of, of neoliberal uh, authorities and technocrats to ensure that the competition is, is 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 sort of celebrated, extended, enforced in various ways. And this, you know, in its most punitive forms, this leads to kind of quite unpleasant forms of workfare reforms where individuals are, you know, compelled to, to accept responsibility for their own unemployment and to become more entrepreneurial and more flexible and more energetic and more optimistic and so on. Uh, and it becomes a sort of a, um, you know, a potentially a, quite a kind of authoritarian logic, really, and and, and not really a, lo- a liberal one at all. Mm. Before moving on to this, uh, I guess, punitive or punishment neoliberalism, mm. that, that idea, I just wanted to ask, um, I guess, a bit of a question around the idea of quantification and how mm. this leads to or, or relates to competition. Yeah. So I think in, in the happiness industry, uh, which I thought was, I really, really enjoyed reading and, and rereading just sort of to prepare for this. I think it's really interesting how this thing, this idea of happiness, it, it, you, you definitely trace how 
or at least my reading of it was the most important thing is that this this thing it, it can't be dealt with in the abstract you need mm. to put numbers to it yeah. you need to um you need to, you need to quantify in this this fabian idea sure. of you know has to be rationalized you have to count it um, yeah. so is it do you think it's the case then that that this quantification is is sort of precedes competition or is it one of these mechanisms that you were just talking about that that neoliberals have to to i guess to measure competition it, it you, you need yeah. you need that in order to to see who's winning the competition that's right i mean i suppose it's interesting to think about what what is the, the political status of numbers and and calculation i mean for in the mm. classic weberian ideal of of modernity the the role of numbers is really what it is in 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 forms of ac early accounting through to sort of classically modern bureaucracy, which is that numbers become a basis for accountability. So you use numbers in order to make people credible in some way, so to make them believable, so that the merchant has numbers in the book, and that way that the merchant can mm. be believed, or the bureaucrat kind of keeps numbers as records, so as to achieve some kind of public trust and legitimacy, which is a kind of you know, has a, a dark edge potentially, but it but it also has a potential kind of basis for a, a sort of public realm of some kind. Whereas what in a, the, the the classically neoliberal style of of quantification is is ranking, um, and it's the ability to use a particular measure so as to render two different people or firms or cities or schools or universities comparable to each other. Because the key mm -hmm. problem of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism starts with the problem of moral relativism. This is what what I would argue is that neoliberalism begins with a with a with a kind of um, I suppose the problem of nihilism in a way, the kind of Nietzschean challenge of of modernity, which is that values are actually sort of we can all choose our own values and there are no values in common anymore. And the neoliberal solution to this is to say, well, what we can still do is we can create these 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 measures, these ranks, and we can put mm. everybody somewhere on them. So instead of you instead of there being sort of a hundred different kinds of restaurant and some are kind of like this and some are like that, and we need all sorts of critics to kind of describe them, we will have a five star rating system and each restaurant will be somewhere on that between zero and five stars. And that which is what the sociologist Wendy Esplin talks about as being um, commensuration. So, and this, this is a very sort of Weberian idea, really. But, um, but the so commensuration device is the ability to compare two things with reference to a third. The third has to be some kind of measure, some kind of ranking tool and of course this is what universities now live in in, in fear of it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know that and they have to study the the way in which the, the the methodology is put together and you know how are they measuring student satisfaction and so on and so on and so on so everybody now has to live uh, sort of waiting for the for to be judged by well it's in a way it's by competition because ultimately the the, the problem is who's going to get ahead of me but uh, but the question of who gets ahead of me isn't as it would be in the in the sort of ideal of austrian economics in in the ideal of, of hayek or schumpeter you know some person might come along and just sort of wipe me out and that that's pretty cruel but it's also sort of leaves a certain level of chaos and anxiety. Um, whereas the, I suppose the kind of applied managerial logic of neoliberalism is much more that audit is, is, is used in a kind of forcible fashion to decide who's at number one, who's at number two and, and downwards from there. And it's interesting how this even, is, this even gets played out in the, in the charity sector in the UK yeah. at least and in, in America where it's who, uh, how do you quantify or how do you put a number against the social impact and social good that you're doing so that even, even that kind of, uh, benevolent who's doing the most becomes um becomes competitive but alex i'm sorry i i, I interrupted you there no no not at all a, um i'm glad actually a... that we're touching on themes that have been touched on on kind of our past couple of podcasts one um being the sort of quantification of, of interpersonal relationships uh that we talked with anna Katchin, and also um i like willie that you discussed entrepreneurialism because that's one uh that's just come out as well um mm -hmm. on the role of the entrepreneur um but i did want what to a, ask what a professional what a professional host you're, you're, you're telling listeners about the previous uh, podcast. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's just good to, to, to drop those footnotes in, oral footnotes. Um, <laughs> anyway, but uh, I did want to ask about the status of numbers and maybe try to make a strange analogy, but that that the sort of uh, Weberian idea of kind of rationalization, that this would sort of push back against tradition and would lead to progress. Is there an idea perhaps in kind of the the way that you present neoliberalism as something which perhaps has gone too far or um, which no longer reaps rewards of rationalization that the sort of um, 
interminable forms of modernization and rationalization under neoliberalism actually start to act against reason itself. Um, and just to make a sort of analogy to maybe bring something else into this is the question of time. Um, it's something that I've mentioned on this podcast a number of times, but the idea that we have perhaps acceler that acceleration was a way of um, carrying through progress, whether it was the state rationalizing things or uh, through military means that the society would become accelerated uh, and that it's got it's reached a point where acceleration has accelerated beyond its own usefulness that it starts mm -hmm. to impede on modernity itself that we have accelerated beyond modernity too far is that something that you would agree with is that the wrong way to conceptualize it no no I'm, I, I agree with that. I mean this is quite a big theme for me in, in nervous states as well where I think that I mean I think that in a way, this is sort of, I think, links also to, to why Donald Trump is president of the United States. I mean, I think that we live in a society where, um, and this links back to war as well, it, that um, where the means of calculation and rationalization are now operating at such a superhuman, superhuman speed, at such superhuman capacity, that it's no longer really a sort of human it's no longer the the job of humans to be rational or reasonable any longer i think we sort of in a way that, um in a way we 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 sort of like we need we we, we desperately need forms of, of of simplification which in a way i think sort of the, the ability of, of, of figures like trump to kind of cut through all of the noise and to provide a sort of something that is clear even if it's sort of um full of lies and, and and madness but it still has a kind of a form that kind of keeps its shape in spite of all of the the, the, the sort of noise around it that i think it makes certain sense so i, I mean I, I definitely agree with that i think that um ultimately the problem that neoliberalism has encountered i mean apart from the fact that clearly the financial crisis was a was a was a grand epic crisis of calculation that 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 everybody's calculations was were made certain sense in in their own very short localized ways but the whole system itself had become kind of incalculable uh, and no one was able to really sort of impose any kind of authoritative perspective on the whole um, and all of the very very clever highly paid people were all ultimately seeing all sort of seeing the system from the inside um, and there was a sort of leap of faith a kind of Hayekian leap of faith that, that this whole system would, would carry on running itself in a in a in a reasonable way because all of the errors would cancel each other out and I mean this was sort of you know <laughs> this this was a an ideology that, that made sense when thinking of relatively simple markets without computers involved, but certainly didn't make sense when 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 the way Wall Street had been sort of digitized and um, the, the growth of derivatives and so on. So I think that I think that's absolutely right. Um, but I think that the other thing which happened with numbers and neoliberalism is that invoking numbers has become a became the the way of demonstrating that that you were a, a serious political person uh, to a great extent in, in what during the kind of heyday of neoliberalism from the sort of 90s through the 2000s yeah. that um that there was a sort of a, a compulsion to 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 invoke numbers to i mean you mentioned charities I mean, it's the same with the arts and higher education and so on that simply kind of demonstrating a will to measure and a will to quantify is a way of demonstrating that that you are a, a sort of serious or a, a cooperative person. Absolutely, um, and and that it's no longer it doesn't really sit in a in a in any kind of um, capacity to try and represent the world it, as a fact uh, would have done in its sort of in its classic form. Uh, instead, its uh, numbers take on what you know social theorists like Michel Callon and others call a, 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 the status of performativity so it's more about the ability to get things done numbers become ways of, of processing things and they're constantly in motion but what numbers cease to do in that kind of situation is to kind of hold up any kind of mirror to the world i mean unless someone like thomas piketty comes along and i mean piketty's achievement was that he had managed to find you know he was left alone for sort of 15 or 20 years building a this 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 big database of of, of incomes measurements um and was able to produce a book like capital in the 21st century because he was sort of outside of this maelstrom there's very few other academics um let alone any kind of consultants or policymakers have that kind of space for sort of and time to carry out a type of scholarly critical um uh, sort of atemporal study in the sense that it's 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 not simply about trying to react and respond and perform the entire time and it's an odd position i guess for for a progressive to be in uh, whatever stripe of progressive you are to be calling for people to uh, 
uh, to be a little bit quieter, to be <laughs> to slow things yeah. down a little bit, um, to just provide us with a little bit of breathing room, because it's a sort of instinctive conservative response. And and yet, oddly, I mean, just on a personal note, I tend to find myself increasingly in this position that uh, that that to that to defend those important progressive moments, whether it's technological progress, social progress, uh, to defend. Uh, political and individual autonomy that actually we might need to sort of slow things down a little bit yeah. to, to make things a little bit quieter to actually have and I progress. Think defending, I suppose, w what someone like Frederick Jameson would call enclaves. Um, I mean, Jameson talks about enclaves as being a very important trope of science fiction and, and the modernist imagination. So, and, and you can think of an enclave in both a spatial and a temporal sense, which is the ability to have a certain time in the day or the week, but equally a certain space where you can go to where you are. In, in some separate, separate rhythm, separate set of norms, so that you're not constantly being dragged into the the maelstrom, that which is ultimately what post Fordism does, um, and it's also what what Deleuze is talking about in his, his postscript on societies of control that was yeah. published in around about 1990. But which is the the way in which capitalism kind of destroys all enclaves. This is what this is also how post. Uh, Fred Jameson understands postmodernism um, is that is the, what it does. It's the destruction of enclaves, the destruction of the space and the time where you can step outside and and and, and reflect in certain ways. And I think, I mean, I'm just I'm in the right now. I'm I'm writing a a lecture which I'm giving in a couple of weeks on on, on anger, and um, the title of the lecture is Anger Fast and Slow. And I'm just sort of reading a lot of bit about you know the the status of anger in our society right now, and everyone's kind of feels aware that anger has taken on a new political status and power and the rise of people like Trump and the extraordinary behavior of Brett Kavanaugh at the Kavanaugh hearings and this sort of thing. But I think that there are lots of, you know, what we have to try and think through, I suppose, in that context is how do we uh, create the time and the space through which the, the reasons for anger can start to become reflected on and and taken seriously because ultimately the problem that we face with with kind of right-wing populism is that they can be just as angry as you know black lives matter or something like that and they were in this kind of state of complete relativism where everybody just seems to be equally angry and then nothing can ever be resolved mm. and unless it's possible to stand back and to articulate that one has reasons for anger and one can dip, put together a set of facts about the basis of one's anger and i know facts sound like a, it all sounds terribly kind of positivist all of a sudden but i think what we're discovering is that unless we can somehow sort of rebuild uh, the base the ability to kind of give karma more factual, more considered and and and, and critically evaluated uh, accounts of ourselves, then all we will have are the emotions that that are, that are just sort of the ones that are kind of flying around Twitter the entire time or or that that are sort of you know people on talk radio or Fox News screaming at each other. Well, I think also something that particularly brings this into view is the fact that, I mean, this is a sort of old discussion, but, but the end of ideology, um, which was something that was first put forward in the 1950s, but, you know, the end of the Cold War was the real moment where that came, I think, came into view. Um, or rather, I guess for a lot of people fell out of view because you no longer had, uh, cohering ideologies for people to make sense of the world. So that when you have people just throwing numbers out there, uh, as you yourself put it, numbers fail to act as a mirror to the world. Yeah. Um, and I guess that partly explains our intellectual confusion today. Um, and on the one hand, anger, um, which seems to be sort of unmoored from any concrete position, as well as, as sort of the abstraction of numbers. Um, and I think we should be clear, I guess this leads to a sort of, um, you know, a lot of anger, a lot of hysteria on all sides of, of the sort of, um, <laughs> of the divide, if you want to constitute the divide as a sort of technocracy versus populism divide. Mm -hmm. um, one solution that you seem to put forward in the book is that science should be more political. I guess I should um, uh, unfold that a little bit um, and maybe see if you would agree with my characterization, but that uh, because expertise has come in for such a bashing and that we do need forms of expertise, that perhaps mm. it needs to be more explicit and self-conscious in its defense of itself. And so you cite you cite the 2017 March for Science as an example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But does that not throw us into a problematic situation where uh, if it's 
science out marching in the street, it becomes not science as a method, as, a, as something that's fundamentally humanistic, but it becomes those people defending team science. And and then maybe yeah. you as a populist goes, I'm not team science, I'm team yeah. whatever, you know? No, I mean, it, it's certainly it's certainly not straightforward how to, where to position, take a position on these issues. I mean, there, there's a lot of, um, I mean, there's a, I think there are some deep dilemmas around this sort of thing. And, and, and I discuss this both sides of that argument in the book, but I think that ultimately, and, and, and I, and I also conclude the book a bit by talking about the Anthropocene, which is really, really sort of, I suppose, offers the political opportunity to science uh, because really science has to ultimately be on the side of securing the conditions of life, basically. And that is a, that is a, a fundamentally political, um, uh, proposition. Um, I mean, I think that as the sort of vocation of science, to use the Weberian notion, is the, is the only vocation that science can, can have in, in the Anthropocene. It's also the vocation that I think we will increasingly see various other movements that are about trying to defend and secure the conditions of life, whether that be um, uh, people um, acting on behalf of or with refugees, whether that be people in, 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 in various radical ecological movements trying to defend natural resources and so on. So I think the, you know, the, the, the potential is for a joining up of different, different bodies uh, and that science can make, scientists can make common cause with that. But I think that, and people like Bruno Latour have been arguing similar things recently, that I think that, I mean, the March for Science is, 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 is obviously, um, and, and I'm, Big, it, I mean, it, it could it can backfire in major ways, uh, rather as the the anti Brexit march in London did recently, because it's possible to say, oh look, all those people, they're a bunch of sort of white university educated um, cosmopolitans, and oh well, of course they would think that sort of thing, and of course that that's the risk, but I think the alternative is to be able to make clear that the claims of science, or not, I mean, obviously it's very difficult to clarify exactly how certain claims get put together because it's so immensely complicated, but that that it is that the scientists are able to make claims on the basis of doing things quite methodically and quite slowly. And one of the things mm. I, I argue in the book is that in some ways the slowness of science could become something that could be turned into a virtue in some ways um, and could, be, could, could rebuild trust. And actually trust in science is actually pretty high. I mean, it's the mediation of science via, via, via the media and via politics that where trust gets lost. But I think that um, the other thing which I, I talk a bit about in the book is that if you look at the where trust is highest across Western democracies, it's in, it's in the medical professions, in doctors and nurses. Um, and I think that there's something possibly there to be learned about the fact that people, the, 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 the political world could be rebuilt around particular ideals of, of not only care, but also of, 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 of compassion, of, uh, of, of, of the slow, methodical nature of, of professionalism. Um, which is a, I suppose, a, a liberal ideal in some ways, but it's it's going to have to become a more kind of radical one in order to uh, defend itself in these conditions. So maybe is there a more critical question that we can ask here? And this is maybe something around this in, in this sort of area. What would you say differentiates um, your approach from one that we've we've seen some other people make, um, which is that essentially. Um, it's been brought to the fore in in the politics around Brexit and Trump's election that people are cognitively unable in, in, for some reason to participate in politics and so we're therefore deserving of some measure of disenfranchisement or overruling science might be part of this or, or not um, which can be then sort of defended as in their own interest and I think this is a, a question that the left is is grappling with more widely so mm. I think it's a, an important one to be specific on if we if we can yeah I think um I'd say two things really one is I think that the the, the the problems that we're seeing at the moment aren't just I mean that what populism we haven't really talked about what populism means but I, I would argue that what populism represents isn't uh, clearly populism is, is good for democracy in lots of ways and so and and I, I I say at the beginning of the book I mean we need to we need to go through populism and we need to sort of we need to sort of dwell in populism I'm not trying to kind of kind of turn the clock back to a to a type of, of liberal centrism or something like that um but i think that what populism does in a beyond the realm of democracy is to cast doubt on the very possibility of forms of um neutral representation of the world in ways that is not that dissimilar to forms of postmodernism as well um but the, the very idea that it's possible for journalists or scientists or regulators or judges or 
um, uh, civil servants to act on behalf of the public or to act as some kind of neutral conduit of knowledge or judgment and so on, uh, which is fundamentally key to how the, the modern liberal state works. I mean, this is a, goes back to the heart of, of, of Hobbes's idea of the state, is that it's able to act uh, in place of the people. Um, and populists cast doubt on the very possibility of this. And of course, in that, in some respects, I think that's to be welcomed because it suddenly sort of reawakens questions that can just lay sort of that can lie asleep for, for decades on end. And it re reawakens the questions of the legitimacy of the media, the legitimacy of, of the legal system, of the government and so on. And all of that, I think, is is, is basically to, to be welcomed. But the question is, what, what I don't think we want is to live in a state of constant um, a war over these things. To I mean, it's exciting, kind of on Twitter to to you know get into sort of Gramscian wars of position and so on, and everyone can be a Leninist sort of in that situation. But I think ultimately, um, a, a better society has to be one in which it, you know it, it has the conditions of, of peace and consensus and 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 cosmopolitanism, which might sound like liberal ideals, but so be it. Um, and I think that I'm not saying that people are not cognitively able to, to get involved in politics. What I am saying is that somehow we need to move through this phase that we're in. And at the end of it, it has to be possible for certain people to have to, to, to be respected as having a more authoritative view on certain things than others. Because if we can't get back to that kind of position, then we then then we will then the alternative is already clear, which is this combination of authoritarianism and big data, which is a, a world in which um, we don't have common worlds other than the common worlds that are kind of made available to us by mm. um, the platforms that will increasingly sort of govern us. Yeah, I think that the left's been struggling with these these issues since uh, 68 and, and onwards. But yeah, just that's to, right. And I, yeah, I think just, also the other thing, which is, I mean, you know, the, the left now with the with 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 the rise of corbyn and so on in the uk kind of it's it's in some ways is, is very kind of enthusiastic about a kind of return to nationalization and and um uh the well you know the rebuilding the welfare state and and so on and, and and all of that's great but it's worth remembering that the success of those things depends entirely on not entirely but it depends heavily on the legitimacy of a type of expert um class of people who are going to run those things i mean in many ways Keynesianism and socialism uh, are more um, dependent on the epistemic authority of, of things like, you know, planners and administrators and bureaucrats than neoliberalism is. And that was exactly Hayek's problem with those mm. things. So I think that if we can't, uh, if we can't um, kind of move through this historical moment and come out the other side with some uh, kind of notion of truth fundamentally, then I, I don't think we can, I think socialism should, should needs to be more concerned about the fate of, 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 of facts in a way than, than neoliberalism. I'm glad you mentioned that the, the sort of technocratic or the roots of technocracy in, in sort of social democracy, um, because it's a point that's often forgotten and I think sheds some light on the question of populism, because I, I'm personally not a huge fan of the term because it's um, overused and it's, it's sort of problematic because maybe I would take issue with one, one way in which you characterize populism will which is that it seems to be that it seems to be anti-representation and there's certain forms of populism which seek to um or, or you know try to militate in favor of a more direct form of popul a direct form of representation uh, between the people and a more legitimate leader um and that which is has a more anti-political tendency which rejects representation um in favor of um in favor of a direct, more authoritarian form of rule, for example. Um, and I guess one thing that I wanted to come on to, which I maybe foreshadowed earlier on, is the way in which uh, this sort of populist spirit can be colonized even by technocracy. So, you know, we see them as opposites. We see technocracy on one side and you have technocratic rule for the past 30 years. And then you have these populists coming, uh, coming to challenge them uh, and really... Uh, becoming a kind of global presence today uh but in fact what we might be seeing is something which technocrats uh or the liberal elite or the liberal establishment however you want to characterize them increasingly adopt sort of more populist modes and i think that the sort of people's vote march uh recently in in london 
seems to do that in a way that it's that it's people supposedly defending the rationalist EU, but in much more populist forms. And that mm. so there you start getting a, a sort of ambiguous thing. Um, and I just wanted to make reference to to a something an episode we did a little while ago, which is something that uh, I, I already mentioned earlier on about neoliberal order breakdown syndrome, which is uh, the liberal establishment being incapable of uh, responding to, understanding the transformations that uh, we are seeing now, the, the sort of political consequences of the 2008 crisis, and are becoming increasingly hysterical and depending increasingly on feelings as opposed to thought. And so suddenly you get a picture emerging where the technocrats are the real populists, you know, um, and that may, perhaps the ra- the populists have a certain rationality to them in mistrusting um, those who say, just trust us, we know what's best for you. Yeah, I mean, um, again, it depends what you mean by populism. I mean, the, the, these are, I mean, the, 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 the kind of textbook definition of populism is that it's, it's an attempt to try and define a, a people and then to oppose them to some kind of elite of some kind um and i'm not sure that 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 the the neoliberal technocrats i mean he, i mean macron i suppose was kind of a technocratic populist in 2017 mm-hmm. in the sense that he created a new party and it was a movement and you know on marche and so on but i don't think anyone really bought the idea that he was kind of a, a serious outsider to the elite um i mean the 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 real threat of a technocratic populism, which is one that has um, been possibly, you know, we make it all, but it's the, it's the threat of the, the kind of Facebook enabled mobilization, which, I mean, on the one hand, this stuff provokes all sorts of crazy conspiracy theories about um, various elections. On the other hand, it shouldn't be dismissed altogether. But I mean, ultimately, if to go back to my kind of um, I mean, and I would say, incidentally, that populism is not fundamentally about representation, even in its best form. It is about kind of mobilization and 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 leadership. Uh, and mobilization is is a good thing. I mean, you know, mobilization is is exciting, and it 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 gives people a sense of purpose, and it has a vitality and a legitimacy that things like kind of boring old representative uh, parliamentary democracy doesn't have. But it's more about the the capacity of a leader to move people, uh, both in an emotional and a and a physical sense, than it is about some kind of direct sort of acting on their behalf. Because part of the the point of of I mean, Corbyn is not a- promising to act on behalf of people. He's trying to build a movement. This is what he, he constantly says. So I think that there are sort of some kind of important distinctions to be drawn there. But I think the 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 real challenge, and this is really I suppose what my my book gets to, Nervous States, is that the ideal of, of of mass mobilization that came out of the french revolution and then formed the the ingredients of nationalism in the, in the 19th century as people like eric hobsbawm describe um that that was always dependent on certain kind of media of of you know songs flags um uh, symbols uh, cult heroes like nelson or whatever it might be um the question which the platforms like Facebook pose is whether that seemingly exuberant sort of affect based form of mobilization can now be um, a basis of a more kind of scientific, deliberate, um, uh, much more kind of finely attuned form of kind of governmentality, if you like, that via the medium of a, of a platform like Facebook, it is possible to mobilize those who can be mobilized to, in, to, to goals that can be pre-selected and so on. Now that we have to be wary of that because there's always been this great kind of fear of of of, of that you know the, the behaviorists are kind of mm. evil geniuses who are pulling all the strings. But nevertheless, I think that the shift, the crisis of of liberalism, if not the crisis of neoliberalism, but the crisis of of, of, of liberal government in in Foucault's sense, um, is arising against a backdrop of a rise of a type of post liberal government, which is the one that the that the platforms potentially um, uh, facilitate, which is ultimately founded on the quasi warlike uh, promise of a constant um, quite sort of um, all encompassing real time mobilization of people sentiments and things um, and that is you know perhaps at least the new teleology even if not the the, the lived reality <laughs>
Well, that's, I think, a, perhaps a great place to finish because uh, it does bring us back to, well, one, to a, a painting of a pretty grim future. <laughs> um, but also, I think we should be... Lovely I guess, note to finish on. Well, yeah, but which is, yeah, it's always good to finish on the doom. We press the doom button to finish. <laughs> Okay, thanks to William Davis for joining us. We are back in two weeks. And hey, it won't be about doom. It'll be about the opposite, fully automated luxury communism. We're joined by Aaron Bastani then with the episode out on the 6th of December. Catch you later. Bye-bye.